Welcome to the Sales Development Podcast, the only audio forum focused and dedicated to helping sales development professionals get better at their jobs and push the practice of sales development forward. This is a place for practitioners in the trenches every day getting it done, whether they're called SDRs, BDRs, ADRs, or others. It's a team charged with creating pipeline out of inbound lead activities and outbound approaches. My name is David Delaney, and I'm the host of the Sales Development Podcast. If you've got subjects you'd like to hear covered on the show or guests you'd like to hear from, hit me up via email at david at tenbound.com or LinkedIn or Twitter, or be sure to subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Google Play, YouTube, or wherever you found us. And there we go. Sean Shepard here on the Sales Development Podcast. Sean, thank you so much for joining us today. Sean is the founder of the GrowthX Academy and the GrowthX Fund, and we're just absolutely thrilled to have you on the Sales Development Podcast today, Sean. Thanks, David. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, excellent. So there's been some developments over the last few years of giving people a chance to get some instruction and education on breaking into the tech field. And When I was introduced to you and your program, I was really excited to introduce it to a larger audience because I think that folks who are thinking about becoming sales development reps, thinking about entering the tech field, or maybe are even a couple of years into it, and never really had any instructions or a larger view on how to operate in the tech business, you know, definitely need to understand what you guys are doing at Growth Act. So could you give us a little bit of your background and then, you know, tell us about the program that you guys have going over there? Sure. I've always been a, uh, I'd like to think a sales professional and a selling founder or co-founder of several companies. Uh, I've had some good wins and some valuable learning experiences. And I've always felt that sales should be treated the same way other professions are and there should be education as such. We're raised to believe that the work that we do is negative, sordid. We hear things about Willie Loman and the death of a salesman or used cars and retail and snake oil. But the reality is, is that the best and most educated sales professionals are often some of the most valued members of any business. And I frankly think it's the greatest profession in the world. All the data supports that. 50% of college graduates end up in some sort of sales-related role with no background, experience, or expectation or even understanding about what they're about to get themselves into. As a result, turnovers continues to be endemically high, 58 to 60 percent across most companies in all regions, tech or otherwise, because you're left to the devices of the people you work for or the training programs they put you in, which are often focused heavily on product, certainly not on customers and market and conversation. They they have an over-reliance on technology and an undervalue of human interaction and the engagement associated with that. And so what I wanted to do was just try and answer the question, what if sales was treated in, uh, in a very similar fashion as being a lawyer or accountant or a doctor? And having hired and trained so many of these people over the years and recognizing that college graduates or even people who are making a transition into a sales role or into technology in general as a, as a career transition, what if they had an opportunity to make an impact before they even began by learning the right way the first time from people who've actually done it? And then when you marry that up with the GrowthX Fund, which was created as a way to invest in seed stage companies that needed help with sales and marketing, we now have this ecosystem that we've built where we invest in companies, we help them grow through sales and marketing expertise and resources, and then we develop the talent to continue to work in them as they grow that know what they're getting themselves into. And so it becomes a virtuous cycle of investing, growing, and building a, an ecosystem that everybody can be a part of. No, it's it's a fantastic program. And everybody that I talk to is so excited about getting involved and the education that they're getting at GrowthX. And I, I'm just wondering, as you were looking out in the market need, coming from the hiring manager perspective, why do you think that we don't train salespeople as much If, like you said, the stat that you cited, 50% of college grads get into sales, and yet it's hard to find the sales major at a university. It's not being necessarily taught as a, like a master's degree, but yet there's such a huge opportunity for sales skills and salespeople. Yeah, because again, a societal, I call it a societal norm, a condition that's been around as long as professional sales has been in existence. And I think even that Going back further, professional sales is a uniquely American experience. 
before us, there were very few democracies in the world that, that uh, had to influence people through or get people to do things through influence and through words as opposed to through force. And then the Industrial Revolution created the advent of the traveling salesperson. And the fact that you could replicate a product, so you needed to replicate the way in which you sold it, which started with the old NCR, and then later on with Tom Watson Sr., the founder of IBM, and that's carried forward. And in big companies that recognize the value of that, they invest a lot of time and effort in it. If you go through a sales program at Xerox or at NCR or at IBM, the world of professional sales know that you're well-trained. And I wouldn't even call it training because I think training is temporary. I think education is behavioral, makes behavioral changes and is delivered more often over time. And what if we could front load and give people the opportunity to invest in themselves and their own education with the relevant skills, knowledge, and behaviors necessary to make that impact right away? And since traditional universities aren't doing it for whatever reason, we can get into that if you like, I don't think they have the incentive to change. I call it institutional education for a reason because it makes me crazy. But even Gallup every year runs a, a survey of college provosts asking them if their graduates are prepared for the workforce. Of course, 9 in 10 say yes, they are. But then you ask employers, 9 in 10 disagree. And they're all frustrated with that. And having been on both sides of it and seeing what's necessary to help companies grow from an investment perspective, no one's paying attention to this. And in today's era, where selling and marketing is more important than it's ever been, because we're not inventing as much anymore, we're just applying different ways of using existing technology, it's easier to start a company than it is to grow one. And the people that are starting them, and the product developers, bless their hearts, aren't good at this. They don't know about it, they don't respect it, or they just don't understand it. And by oftentimes, by the time they do, it's, it's too little too late. Right. One of your seminars, how to talk to humans. That's <laughs> right. I mean, it's yeah. it's harder it's harder than it looks. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the whole reason I started that was technology is an incredible thing. It's bringing us all closer together, making us more interconnected. But it has made us at the same time less interpersonal because people are focused on talking to screens, not to humans. And what we need to do is bring back the awareness of the importance of that aspect of it. Because you know, David, as a sales leader, that everything just begins, right? Every message through an email, every piece of outreach, every ad, every piece of market messaging is designed to generate a response. And if you're in a business where that response requires human interaction, you better know what to say, when to say it, how to say it, and how to figure out how to solve other people's problems. Exactly. And a couple of things. One is this lack of education has created an opportunity for entrepreneurs like yourself to, you know, to fill a gap that's obviously a huge gap in the marketplace of preparing people for this. The other thing that I, I'm thinking of is if an SDR came to you and said, I've got two SDR applicants, I've got two opportunities in front of me. One is at a big established company that probably has a, a laser focused sales training program, or another is at a startup. Would it make more sense to the sales applicant to go with the larger established company and get immersed in that or to the startup where they kind of have to make it themselves? What, what are your thoughts? It depends on what they want. They have to recognize the difference between an early stage company and a mature company. They have to think through things. They have to think about things in terms of, do I want to earn while I learn so I can go to a startup later? Or am I a startup person and I'm going to learn more on the job by making mistakes and, and learning the hard way? Now, do I like freedom? Do I like ambiguity? Do I get excited about the chaos and shit show that a startup is? <laughs> or does it frustrate me and scare me? So you have to look at things from a personal needs and personal risk assessment perspective as well. Really good point. And when you look at the sales program and the sales and business development program at GrowthX, tell us about some of the, the applicants and some of the people that have come through the program. Where do they come from? What are they trying to accomplish with their career when they have applied for the program? Yeah, great question. Most of them are career transitioners, college educated, some have master's degrees, they come from different industries like real estate and law and finance and you know traditional industrial environments, accounting, whole host of different fields. They know they want to work in tech and they know they don't want to code. And in the Valley, what do we say, right? If you want to deliver value, you need to be close to the code or you need to be close to the cash. And if you're not, if you're not into the coding, then you should be into the caching. <laughs> 
So they look at it from that point of view. They're already accomplished people, and they want to get leveled up, and they want to get access to a network, and they recognize the value of education. And they also appreciate the modern approach that we take, which is this flip mastery, competency-based, fully immersive program where they, they're living, breathing it at the community level every single day. There's hundreds of mentors to help them. There's dozens of leaders and instructors and successful entrepreneurs. There's other people of diverse backgrounds and experiences. And there's a whole community and ecosystem of companies that are eager to get to know them and work with them on real projects to see whether or not this develops into something more. What are some of the things that someone didn't have access to GrowFX, for example? What are some of the things that they focus on while they go through the program? Well, um, on the sales and business development side, everything starts with business and marketing acumen because the philosophy is, is that in order to be successful in sales, you have to help others be successful. And the best and, and fastest way to do that is to understand their business as well, if not better than they do. So getting leveled up on how to think, not necessarily what to think, but how to think, how to analyze and assess a business, how to figure out how they make money, how they sell it, to whom they sell it, what metrics matter to them the most, how the individuals you're selling to are measured, and how to quantify value based on that is critical. And so we work very diligently for the first several weeks on training the mind and the mindset with a series of behaviors and exercises and activities to help people quickly size up a company and how they can help that company be successful potentially. Then we move into marketing and understanding how leads are driven into your business. Then we move into all the different sales models and methodologies that are in common practice in the Valley today. We don't advocate one over another. We expose them to all, share the virtues, let them apply them and practice them so that if they go to one company that, uh, that's into spin selling, they understand it. We go to another company where they're into challenger, they get it. They go to a company that's applying the predictable revenue model, they get that. If they go to a company that's into new strategic sales and requires sales engineering as a part or a function, they understand it because they've had exposure to all of it. Then we dig into the process and techniques, the, the, the actual deep down tactics. What are the daily activities you're going to perform depending on what role you're in? Whether you're going to sales development, whether you're going down the funnel into an acquisition role as an account executive or account manager, whether you're going into customer success for onboarding retention and growth, or you want to go into sales ops or enablement, you want to support the function, we provide a path and experience for everybody based on what they want. And then we move into management and leadership and then career development. How are we going to apply the sales funnel and the marketing funnel process to finding you the job that you want? working with the people that you want to work for and with. And you marry all of that up, coupled with working on real projects with real companies with the support and guidance of the entire team, you walk out with, a, we hope, clarity and on, on what you want to do, where you want to do it, to have demonstrated that you can do it, and then we present them to the community as ready to make an impact. Nice. And then you've got, you've got your network already built out, not only of the GrowthX companies, but you know folks that you know over the the course of your career that you can broker introductions, which are huge. That's right. Every time you mentioned at the beginning of this, you were really excited to hear what we were doing because you think it should exist. I get the same reaction from everyone. And everyone who struggled and worked to get to where you and I have gotten in our lives would have loved to have had this. It would have accelerated everything for us. And so they want to give back. So they're actively involved in hiring. They're actively involved in referring talent. They're actively involved in coming in and guest lecturing. They're actively involved in taking coffee meetings and mentoring. Um, they're actively involved in developing their own careers as mentors through this peer group of amazing people that want to give back through this through this vehicle. I love it. And, and you know, I'm thinking for the folks who are on the call who are already SDRs or they're SDR managers, um, you and I, Sean, it's taken us several years, <laughs> maybe decades, to know all the vocabulary and understand all the different references that you made as you were going through the curriculum. But we, we had to learn that the hard way, right? I mean, we had to learn that yes. trial and error. We'll take real good notes of the podcast so that, you know, everybody who's trying to, you know, kind of cobble some of that stuff together will have those those resources available. And then, of course... You know, if you're thinking about doing the Growth Act program, um, man, it's all right there. It's laid out over because of Sean's, uh, you know, trial and error over the last 20 years, probably, right? <laughs> yeah, spent 10 years developing this curriculum. 
and revising and iterating it to get it to this point. And anybody is welcome to just go to gxacademy.com and request the sales and business development syllabus. It's sitting right there, and it'll give them a complete framework of everything that we do. And if they want more information, you know, they can contact me or anybody on the team anytime they like. Nice. That's amazing. Okay, cool. So I'll put that link up as well. So people can dig in and, and do, do their research on that afterward. Because like I said, I mean, you and I can sit here and talk about it and understand, yeah, I mean, if, if you did all those things, you'd have a huge head start over someone just entering the workforce. Um, but to, to have it laid out in a curriculum is so valuable. So Yeah, and it's yeah. not just for entry-level folks. You know, <laughs> we all know the sales development role is potentially an entry-level or a path in, but there's a lot of people that come in with a whole host of different life experiences that apply right away. And we have people that have been SDRs for two to four years that come to the program because they want to level up and they want to prepare themselves to be an account executive. Or we have people that want to pivot into different roles who might want to go into traditional business development, which most people don't even know is a thing because we call sales roles. Every time I see a sales role, I, come, I, I find a new title of a job that's not sales to describe a salesperson. <laughs> <laughs> you ever run across that? There's account executive, there's territory manager, there's regional this, there's business development, there's new business development, there's account director, there's, there's all these names, but they all essentially are tying to one of those same things. They're either trying to attract people in, you're trying to acquire them, you're trying to onboard them, you're trying to keep them happy through retention, or you're trying to grow that business. And so trying to understand it through that prism of what I call the sales continuum is is important so that you can figure out what you want to do. Yeah, exactly. At the front end of the show is just that the sales almost has a negative connotation sometimes. And so they try to put these fancy titles on it. But at the end yes. of the day, with programs like yours, it's trying to turn around that connotation that's out there in society, uh, elevating the, the profession. We, we, we have the greatest profession in the world. Because this is being published, I won't say who I had a great meeting with today, but this person is a very successful person, owns a, a, a professional sports franchise, Harvard MBA, and, and is, has had a very successful career and said to me, there's no greater profession in the world than sales. And he said, every problem he's ever had in business has been solved with more sales. And he's right. And those of us that have lived long enough and have done this long enough recognize that and appreciate it. The problem is, is that when we're kids, we're taught to think this is bad. Yet, uh, by all measures, it's one of the best professions. We have the highest average earned income over a lifetime of any major white-collar professions. We have the lowest divorce rate, one of the highest happiness quotients, and doctors and dentists are killing each other. <laughs> so, you know, it's up to you. You should be proud of what you do, and you should treat it with the level of dignity and, and professionalism and pride that any other traditional industry uh, commands. And if you educate yourself accordingly, there's nothing you can't achieve. No, I completely agree. And, and you know, it's um, having that mindset also within our own self as salespeople. You know, if realizing that this is a, a wonderful profession, it's something that, like you said, it, it's got uh, financial considerations, and a lot of times it's a lot of fun. It's also very stressful, uh, obviously, but having the mindset of being confident as a salesperson, calling yourself a salesperson, it's also, it's up to you how you want to carry yourself. If you can manage your mindset, you can manage your success. You can't do these things alone. So you have to get your mind right and keep it right and be mindfully aware of it. Collaborate with others and stay positive and keep pushing forward and learn and be open. And if you do those things, you're already better than 80% of the people that do this work. And then if you actually talk to people about their problems instead of your product, you're better than 90% of the people that do this work. And I understand why that's a problem. We raise money based on a product that we build. We set expectations that we're going to sell that product with assumptions based on other people's history, not our own. And then we have pressure to close business. And everybody wants to talk about their product and everybody wants to get to the close. And the reality is, is our customers don't care about our products. They care about the problems we solve for them. And so we have to become focused on problem solving, not product selling. Oh, that I, I completely agree. And I, I had a gal that I had worked with in a past life um, named Carrie Simpson on the show a couple of episodes ago, and she runs a team of people who basically they do product evaluations for startups. And 
they they take a product that a group has created and they really make sure that it will actually sell before they move on <laughs> and, and spend a lot of time working on the product. And it could be that you could work on something for years and then just realize that nobody wants to buy it. And that puts a lot of pressure on the salespeople. <laughs> So the frustration is, is I've been there. I know what it's like to attach yourself as a sales professional to a product that has no market. It's frustrating, it's brutal, and then you get blamed for it, get fired, or a sales team gets fired, and they get replaced with another one, and nothing changes. Because people on the product side don't respect the market side, and don't understand and appreciate that. And they build shit people don't want. And as a sales professional, you need to do your research and due diligence about, is there product market fit? Do people want what you're selling before you enter and take that job. What advice would you have if someone's coming in as a new SDR or a new account executive and they're the traditional training program, which is sit with the product management team for a couple of weeks and learn about what we do. How do they go about doing a mini growth X as quickly as possible so that they can feed their family? You know? Yeah, it's yeah. a great, it's, it's a great question. Um, well, you know, you're not going to change people's opinions and thoughts on this stuff overnight. So don't even at the beginning bother trying to convince your bosses or your boss's boss that they need to take a market-centric or customer-centric approach as opposed to a product-centric. All you can do is do your own version of learning and use that learning, create the connections, develop conversational flow, and outperform your peers. And once you do, you will get the credibility to make the changes you want because traction always speaks louder than words. And that's the best part about being a sales professional. It's easy to measure us. And if you can sell it, then people will listen to you and you will have choices. If you do all those things and you can't sell it, then it's probably not you. It's probably the product in the market. And look around you to see what other people are doing. Learning number one is before you take the job, do your due diligence. Does this product really solve a problem that's a pain point in the marketplace? And what are people saying? You know, look up the product on G2 Crowd or some of those other sites and read about it and make sure that it's something that's hitting it. And then number two, take ownership of your job, right? And really go in and take it from a, what did you call it? A market centric perspective? Yes. And don't be afraid to ask those questions during the interview process. Mm. Uh, You don't have to be arrogant about it, but you just need to be curious about it. We have a career search methodology, proprietary career funnel that we've built based on the sales and marketing funnel and based on the Lean Business Model Canvas, and it's called the Career Canvas. And we'll be releasing a free tool to the the community and to the world uh, at the end of January, early February, that people can use as a decision framework map so that they can think about how to do diligence a company. And it doesn't just involve the traditional things like we do this product for this customer base, we solve these problems with this solution, and we sell it through these channels, and this is how we make money and what we charge, and this is our cost basis, and this is how we measure success, and here's our unfair advantage. But it goes into the things that are personal. What's the market risk of the company? What's the financial risk of the company? What's the execution risk? And then what are my personal needs? People need to view it like they are an investor because you're investing your time, the best years of your life, and your good heart and emotion into a company. So set yourself up for success as best you can by doing the research to determine, is it a great team? Are the investors grade A investors? Do they have a great track record? How many customers do they have right now? More importantly, how many paying customers do they have? What kinds of customers are they? Who are you going to be working for? Are you looking for a great mentor and leader like David Delaney you can learn from? Or do you just want to go to work for this company because it's got a great brand? Either one is fine, but you need to ask the questions. Most people don't know how to ask the questions. They don't even know what the questions are. And this Career Canvas Decision Framework gives people the questions. And they just have to go do the research and fill in the blanks. And they can get a lot of it and pre-search through the web and through this, the, uh, the, the, the resources that you just call, talked about, for example. But when they can't get it through the web, they need to be prepared to ask those questions when they go in for the interview. And they need to get satisfactory answers. And they need to do it from a place of humility and curiosity. Don't be, don't be an asshole about it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and understand 
are you going to be set up for success? Because whether or not you are or aren't is going to have a big determining factor on your own personal brand. You and I know a lot of people who have been very successful in Silicon Valley and got more credit than they probably should have for being present while a company was successful because they already had product market fit and they were growing like a weed. And that's okay. People have to decide if that's the path they want to take. When you go to an early stage company, you can have a greater impact and the reward can be greater, but the risk is also super high and the stress levels are high. But if you go into a later one, you have less of an impact. You might learn more, especially from a great mentor like you, or, but at the same time, your, your, you know, your reward isn't as high financially. Risk is lower. So there's a whole host of those things you have to weigh, and you need to ask yourself those questions and think about it, quant- both quantitatively and qualitatively. Man, I I wish that I had had this conversation with you 10 years ago. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that sounds so incredibly valuable, you know? And, and you know, I think when you're in a, a job search, you know, you, you kind of get tunnel vision. You I got to get a job. I got to get the next job that, you know, comes up. And sometimes, you know, a lot of those criteria go right out the window. You're just like, hey, it's got a, it's got a solid brand. The people seem really cool. And I'll be happy to put it on my resume. And then you get in there and it is not as advertised. Right? Yeah, because employment branding is just is just sales and marketing. Yeah. Companies will lie to you about how great they are to get you to come uh, to attract you into their to their community. Just the same way that bad salespeople lie and marketing people lie to you about how great their product is. And so you have to be wary of that. And the, much in the same way, look, you have to treat it like a job. If you treat it like a job, and you're a great sales professional who's trying to look at a market, and you're trying to fill that funnel, and you want this outcome, then treat it that way. Which means, hey, I'm trying to reach product market fit, but I'm also trying to think about person company fit. There's only one of you. There's 26,000 companies in the Bay Area alone that could hire you. So be discerning. Make good decisions. Be highly targeted, just like you would when you're selling and marketing. So that when you have those conversations, they're for real, and they're with the companies you want to be with, doing the things you want to do with the people you enjoy most. And that's what makes people happy, other people, not companies. A company is just a collection of people. So you have to think about it in those terms. Treat your job search like the job that it is. I've watched great, super successful people move from one exit to the next and treat it that way. I had one come through, one of our mentors, like, Again, just to protect your name, I won't bring it up. Very successful, has had uh, two exits. And then in search of her third, she came in, she sat down with me, and she built out a spreadsheet of all the companies she had targeted that she wanted to work for. And she built out her decision framework for everyone. And we reviewed it like it was a sales funnel and a pipeline management review and helped make a decision about where she was going to go next. And she landed in a great place at the right time with the right people doing what she wanted. Because she took it that seriously. And by the way, that took her eight months. This stuff doesn't happen overnight. Oh, my gosh. Okay. This interview just paid for itself in droves. I mean, if one person, <laughs> if one person sits down and, you know, downloads the, the, the funnel at, or creates it themselves and just puts that much thought process into their own lives, if you think about it. I mean, why not spend so much time thinking about it? I think we all rush into these decisions without uh, putting a thought process as we should. We do, and I understand why. Um, It's an emotional time. It's a harrowing experience. We have financial pressures. When we don't have a job, we're made to feel or we make ourselves feel like we're less of a person than we are when we do have a job. Applying for jobs online is the worst thing anybody can do. Why? Because... The average recruiter gets 122 job applications per job they post online. And they're, they're carrying or representing, on average, 35 to 50 jobs. So do the math. They can't talk to hundreds or thousands of people. So what do they do? They use applicant tracking software to filter people based on the keywords in their resumes. And people get filtered out, and then they immediately feel rejected. Well, if you're a sales professional, you're used to rejection. It's an everyday occurrence. And it's okay. It just means it's not a fit. There's no such thing as no. There's just not now. So the last thing I tell people to do is apply for a job. The first thing they should be doing is researching companies, targeting, building a funnel full of companies that they think they want to work for, identifying whether or not they have a role that fits them. 
if they do, find people that know people in that company and reach out to them directly and have real conversations with them the same way you would if you were selling. If you were selling to a company, you don't go to somebody's website and go to their hello at growthx.com form and fill it out and put your, uh, your information in and go, I've got this great product and I want you to call me back and then expect to call back. No, but we do that with the job applications every day. It's insane, right? Because we think they control the process. Bullshit. You control your own process. The last thing you should do is apply for a job online. The students that go through my program, the last thing they do is look for a job through an online application. They research companies. They find out if they have a role. If they do great, we help them find the right hiring managers and economic decision makers. They create opportunities to engage with them by delivering value. And they use that to get the information that they want to determine whether or not this is a fit for them. And then they move forward accordingly from there. And the last thing they do is apply for a job. Typically when compliance requires it at the end. And they says, look, you've got you to apply. We need a job requisition number that we can attach to your resume. So in case the government shows up, we can tell them that we're doing, you know, we're, we're tracking every resume that comes in, et cetera. But ultimately, it's the last thing they do. They're having a consultative conversation with a hiring manager about what problems they have and whether or not they can help them solve them and whether or not they're a good fit for that. And that's the conversation. And that's the way professional sales gets done. And that's the way you find person company fit. You've, <laughs> you've applied modern sales methodology to the job hunt and completely blown up the traditional way that people look for jobs. Yeah, I mean, you're just, as a person, you're a product. And as an employer, it's your market. And we talk about product and market, selling a product to a market. We should do the same thing. We're, as a person, we are a product. We are a valuable product. And the right company, the right market, the right customer, the right employer will recognize that. And don't forget, the difference is, the big difference is, is you only have one product to sell when you're looking for a job. <laughs> right. You don't get to repeat that at scale. You just have to find the one that only takes one. So do it right. Treat yourself the way you deserve to be treated and take yourself through the process. And if you do, you will get what you want. 26,000 companies in the Bay Area. I mean, that's a pretty, pretty darn good uh, addressable market. <laughs> I can't swing my headphones uh, without hitting one. <laughs> so it's amazing. They're everywhere. They're everywhere. And so if you treat it that way, you look at it through that view that your job search is a job. You're applying the sales and marketing funnel to your job search. Product market fit exists the same for person company fit. The employer is the customer. You're the product. How would you sell it? How would you get there? You'd network your way in. You'd find out who the decision makers were. You'd map out your account. You'd figure out the roles and the influencers and what buyer types you're dealing with. And you'd you'd start to execute against that. You'd find your coaches and your champions and you'd work that out. And hopefully, if you do it the right way, you're not selling, you're seeking fit. You've hypothesized value. You're reaching out because you think you might be able to help these people based on what you know. And you'd love to have a conversation to see if that's in fact the case. And then take it from there. And then qualify, qualify, qualify. Is this a good fit for me? Do I want to continue to have these discussions? This is what executives do. Right. Watch them do it every day. Exactly. Right? And, and, you know, why not apply it to your own life? I mean, you're the CEO of your own, your own life, right? <laughs> Absolutely. What is a headhunter? What is a staffing agency? They're a reseller. Clear. That's all they are. They're turning around and selling you as a product to some other customer. Mm. Yeah. They're trying to find a fit. It's no different. But when you can visualize it, and you know as well as I do, if there is product market fit, if it does exist, if there is a market for you as an employee, then it becomes a numbers game. And you reverse engineer the funnel from the bottom up. And I have my folks create a goal. Within 12 weeks, starting this process, within 90 days, they build a 90-day strategic plan that gets them multiple job offers out of the bottom of the funnel. And so to get multiple offers, you have to have X amount of interviews, which means you have to have X amount of informational interviews which means you have to have X amount of qualifying conversation, it means you have to have X amount of attempts and outreach, which means you have to have an X amount of companies that you qual pre-qualified into your funnel. And that's how it works. It's exactly like a prospecting plan. Absolutely. It's, it's, a the same, it's the same thing. But first you have to identify, just like you do as a company, your ideal customer profile. You have to do the same as an employer or as an, a potential employee for your ideal company profile. 
Mm. And that's how you use the canvas. What kind of industry, sector, product, market, role, culture, compensation, benefit, stage of company, do I want to work in? And you build those profiles out. And just like we do in sales and marketing, we develop multiple profiles. We test those profiles to find out which ones work and learn from those and make a, iterate and make a better decision and then go after those profiles. No, this is, it's exactly like making a prospecting campaign or to go out and build up your territory if you're a new salesperson. But like you said, in this case, you are the product. <laughs> That's right. You've still got to build a list of companies either way. Right. You still yeah. got to find out who the contacts are in there that could potentially be interested in you or your product. Either way, you still have to develop messaging in a way to get to them and get them to say, "Ooh, that's interesting. Tell me more." Either way, once you do, you have to create conversation. Once you do that, that has to turn into a commitment to a next step or a decision that this isn't a fit, right? right? And that's the process, and you build a funnel and you manage it. Amazing. Okay, so say someone, especially if they're in the city or if they can get to the city and they want to go just interact with people, network, and learn some of this stuff and learn more about the GrowthX program, I know that you do a lot of networking seminars like talk to human, how to talk to humans and stuff like that. What are some of the things that you have coming up that they could possibly attend or check out? Yes, we run an event every week, a live event in person, either at our offices at Galvanize in Soma, 44 Tahama Street, San Francisco, or with at the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center, which is next door on the corner of Howard and First. They're wonderful partners of ours. They use They love our educational material. And they provide it to all their entrepreneurs and members as well. And every week we rotate. One week we do How to Talk to Humans, which is sales and business development focused. The next we do a growth marketing event, which is coming up this week. Eli Schwartz, who's the head of international growth for SurveyMonkey, will be on stage with my business partner, Will Bunker, who is the founder of Match.com, talking about growing globally. The following week, uh, last week, actually, just this last week, we had our U- user experience and product design meetup that had the author of Lean Product Playbook, a best-selling uh, product management and, uh, and lean product design uh, book by Dan Olson, which was fantastic. And then the following week after that, we do a career event where we go over all the things you and I were just talking about. It's called Hack Your Career. It'll be at the NASDAQ Entrepreneur Center. I believe it's on January 31st. Don't quote me on that, but Go to uh, gxacademy.com forward slash events, and you can see a list of all the events. Sign up and register there. Um, And I run a monthly career workshop that actually gives all the visuals and tools associated with this conversation you and I had. Regardless of what industry anybody wants to be in or what role, it doesn't matter. This is a life skill tool set that you can have to help you get the job that you want. Beautiful. That is awesome. I'll put that link up after the show. And it's it's funny because if I was a single, you know, person hungry, wanted to get ahead in my career, you can literally go out like every night in San Francisco, it seems, <laughs> and uh, go to some of these networking events. They always have food. They usually have drinks. And they're just the best way. I mean, even if you go to one that's not necessarily revolving around your industry i mean you just walk up to people smile and say hi and it's you never know who's connected to who and what it could lead to so that's uh, right you can check out meetup.com does it if you don't have a meetup.com account get one and then subscribe for the areas that interest you and you'll get regular notifications sometimes to a a nauseating degree (laughs) but at least you'll learn and get exposure to that eventbrite has a listing um you know all the co-working communities have, and, and the industry stuff, they all have great meetups and events, and you just have to search and find them and get out and check them out. And you'll meet so many wonderful, interesting people that have similar desires, similar thoughts and fears and concerns, and similar interests. Um, and then also on Facebook, we've got our SF Tech Sales Leaders Facebook group that brings together a group of people that you're a member of as well, David, um, that delivers wonderful content. On LinkedIn, there's a lot of wonderful sales leadership groups. Sales Hacker, of course, with Max Altshuler. And and then there's there's Sales Stack on Slack, which is a community there. There's a lot of cool stuff going on. Peter Kazanji has a Modern Sales Pros group on Google, which is just for sales leaders in in ops and and, uh, and sales. Uh, But that's another great group. So there's a lot of good people doing good things out there, and, um, and we need it all, and, uh, and people just need to get themselves exposed to it. 
Yeah, get in there, you know, learn all you can, get out, meet people, you know, talk to humans, you know, get get to the next Growth X event. Because I mean, hey, I, I'm I learned how to find a job on this call, and, and yeah. <laughs> there's there's just uh, one one good tip or one good connection that you make makes all the difference. So never you never know who you know or who you know knows, and right. never never pass up an opportunity to meet new people because it can change your life. Totally, totally. Well, Sean, I just want to thank you so much. We're right up against the hour. It has been awesome and educational and like i said i'll put these links up um on my blog after the show and uh you know thanks again for coming on my pleasure david anytime i love your brother thanks for what you do for the community okay bye-bye bye